myself again. I'm John Hildebrand. I'm a principal technologist here at Cohesity. And what we're going to try, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about utilizing and achieving disaster recovery with these cloud components. So w w as we go back to the enterprise cloud journey, we can't forget that on-premises exists. So as much as pundits and everybody else out there likes to believe everything's going to be moving to these objects, some things just cannot go, will not go, they're going to stay, or old style enterprises are just going to dig their heels in and they're going to stay out there. So when we think about what's on-premises, we talk about the package business apps. I think uh, e even though Rollinson gave the example of like SAP HANA, uh, I mean, its roots are as a packaged on-premises, large scale application. Same thing when we get into custom and legacy, other legacy apps that exist in a lot of enterprises. And then the whole hybrid thing. So how do we, how do we utilize cloud in some capacity with on-premises? And in our particular case, what we want to talk about is specifically disaster recovery. So one of the things that we talk about when, you know, most of us have been in this industry long enough, disaster recovery tends to exist as something off in the ether. It is something that we always want to get to, but never can get to, whether it's cost, time, something that keeps things from happening. Most of us, most of us actually are on, if we're being honest to some degree, uh, are barely able to keep up with just the simplistic insurance policy in the form of backups, let alone work towards disaster recovery. And on top of that, when you think about it, when you get to the point, the recovery plans, well, if you haven't even really thought about it and implement it, you don't really have a really good plan to begin with to start off with. Then on top of it, as far as we're concerned, and it was brought up by, I'll reference Rawlinson again, we've, trust me, he loves when I reference him. I so. know. <laughs> so, the, the, the idea of being able to use the backups for something other than that real expensive insurance policy, being able, to, being able to take something from it and actually gain value other than just sitting there doing nothing. Then on top of it, over the course of time, a lot of the times what happens is in, if anybody is going towards DR, they started off with a good RPO, RTO number, and things have just kind of fallen off the wayside. They're not able to keep up with the numbers or the any sort of plan that they put out there in the first place. We all know network considerations have to be have to be put into play, especially with cloud. Speeds and feeds are very, very important. I mean, if it wasn't, we wouldn't see things like Express Route from Microsoft and trying to sell you faster on ramps to their services. Plus. If you factor in a lot of these DR plans, they were made well before the cloud was even, even a thing. So they're probably not even optimized to be able to utilize these components. Then last but not least, complex management and lack of automation. Um, some of these, some of these uh, capabilities that we've used for years, I, you think about it nowadays, most, most of the new breeds of applications, they're coming with the APIs necessary to enable, to, to, to enable the workforce that are using it to, to operate. Some haven't still or not evolving with that for some reason. So this, this, they're, the management's complex. They can't really be as well automated or you have to stitch together four things to make things happen. That's not what I would consider true automation. So when we talk about our platform and what we like to provide, we realize that a lot of organizations out there, their recovery times vary based off of applications. So some you may be able to get by with only worrying about being able to recover within days versus hours versus minutes. So what we have is we've essentially got workflows built into the system um, that we have that we're going to highlight here essentially in this section. So the first thing is, uh, I'm, 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 I'm hurting my own brain about to utter this phrase, but the, the idea of poor man's DR. The idea that we can take archival capabilities and then bring that down from an, uh, from an archive and, and hydrate and make things available. This is typically, obviously, this is going to take the longest. We get into, we're going to get into with uh, Diane and here, um, cloud spin. The idea that we can convert workloads from one, one source and make them available in another source and take care of that in, a shred, uh, in, in an automated process. And then last but not least, utilizing that cloud edition component to actually be able to perform what we call failover and fail back by being able to take a, a workload or data fail it over to the cloud edition, make it available, and then once the DR is done, shift that data as after it's been updated in its, in its DR site, bring it back to your on-premises location. 
So in this case, now we're going to shift into the archival capability. Um, I can, I think most of us will admit archiving really isn't the, the sexiest topic as far as data is concerned, but it is a very important topic. But what we've identified, especially over the course of time, is that it's still slow and inflexible. When we talk about some of the capabilities that we have in our platform versus other things that are out there, one of the things that strikes me as odd is that you don't have the ability, some, some tools don't have the ability to archive to multiple locations at the same time. So being able to be flexible in where you want to put your, put your data and being able to put it wherever you want at the same time is, is something that uh, I, I think when, when we get into our demo, we'll be able to show that off a little bit, a little bit better. So things like the retention policies are very inflexible. So once you put data out there, whether or not you can adjust them uh, to either take longer or take less time, then also the, the data recoverability sometimes is very, well, I mean, we're talking about flexibility. So data recoverability is something that is um, very inflexible from some, some other uh, utilities that I've ran into in the past. Plus, we talk about this as a complex process. Just, just the ability to pull the data back down isn't necessarily the most, uh, isn't, isn't just the one part of it. So making sure that there's a lot of API automation and being able to complete the process. Plus being able to search through that data. And to be able to identify what you need, you gotta search through it and find it. And at the same time, the granular recovery, um, and we talk about pulling it from these different accounts, the egress costs. Then we move into the higher cost category where at the end of the day, you gotta keep up with these new investments because different storage classes. I turn around and it seems like AWS has a new S3 storage class available to be able to use. So trying to keep up with these things as they evolve is, is something that takes, not just from a, a monetary perspective, but time and effort. Those are part of the cost as well. So when we talk about the modern, uh, so our, our archival and retrieval approach, the idea is what we can do is from our platform, send the data up to our public cloud uh, offerings, when you think about it, S3, blob storage, Glacier, we're, we'll show a bunch of it in the, in the demonstration perspective. We even managed to squeeze a little more capability, a little more um, capacity out of it when we send it up to these, these locations. So we add even more um, dedupe and compression capability, which also helps with those network transfers. We try to slim it down even more. Then on top of it, within our platform, we have the ability to do the search within all the stuff that's available within the archive to um, basically allow you to identify what you're looking for within all of that data that may accumulate during that, high, uh, that long retention policy. And on top of it, the flexibility, we don't necessarily, when we talk about recovering with this, we can, um, if on-premises no longer exists, all you have to do is spin up another instance of our software somewhere, connect it to that particular source, and it'll pull it down to another Cohesity platform somewhere else. So there's, there's a lot of flexibility as far as where you can return that data to. So with that, I'm going to get into an archive uh, demo. And from the looks of it with the folks in the back of the room, I'm going to have to blister through this pretty quickly. So let me connect back up to my desktop. So to, to set this up, I'm basically, it, it's a single VM that I have in my environment. And what I want to also uh, mention as well is the last time we did a demonstration of this particular feature, it was tied to the backup uh, process itself. So the backup process had to run, then archive would run. We've actually separated those processes out. So you can do out of band archiving at any particular point. Um, through any of the jobs that you have. So you can see I have three different jobs that are available that I've ran on this particular SQL instance that I've, I've backed up. So what, all I have to do to enable archiving, so there's two different ways. I can add it to a policy and it can automatically do it with the backup run. But in this case for out of band, I'm gonna go edit the run and you can see I've got some options to add either replication or archival capability. Well, guess what? I'm gonna do that. I have a few external targets registered. So these are registrations to like S3 endpoints, to blob, uh, Azure Blob endpoints, GCP buckets. And I, last but not least, I can mention this as well. Even though the term is cloud archive, we can use other NAS sources. So you can use a different on-premises solution or something in a DR site away, as long as it can, it can communicate in, uh, through NFS over to that particular device. So in this case, 
I'm going to say to my GCP archive, I'm going to retain you for three years. I'm going to go to my AWS S3. We'll do three months. So each one of these, I have the flexibility of adjusting at any given moment. We'll do three weeks. I'm even going to send something to a Glacier Vault. Let's take you to, let's say, <coughs> seven years. And then last but not least, um, one of the things we've added is we're trying to keep up with some of the AWS S3 changes. We do have IA available as well, and I would fully expect that some of the other, other tiers available within S3 will, will be coming. And before anybody mentions, yes, deep, deep archive is likely something that'll, that'll be added to this once we, once we get our hands on it. So I've got, the, I've got the five archives available when I save this. You can see the job changed a little bit, and now I have these copy task statuses available out here. So we've already run the backup task. You'll notice we're not kicking that off. There's no new backup task. We already have the data from the backup. So we're utilizing stuff, something that's already on the Cohesity platform, and now we're going to shoot it out to the other archive locations. And you can see in some particular cases, we've already started writing data. GCP, we're already out to 39%, some of these other cases. But for the sake of time, I'm not going to let this complete. Um, but do know that it, 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 it will write to the different endpoints. And in some particular cases, let's take a look at its events archive. Of course, it had to be that one. Now, there's a folder structure that we write out here that the backups, that, that does the metadata, the data itself, and our snap tree capability so it knows where it exists as far as the snapshots that have been taken over the life cycle of that. Uh, of that capability. So once that, once that completes, we've essentially written the archive data out. To recover, this is where we have cloud, cloud retrieve is the recovery option. So if we set this up on another device, what we'd have to do is register the source and essentially follow through and pull that data down from the source uh, to the new Cohesity destination. And from there, then the jobs and the, uh, the snapshot trees that were available that we archived will be available now on that new platform. Essentially, again, kind of allowing for the idea of, I, I hate saying it, but a kind of a poor man's DR to some degree. But it's, it's the longest, it's the most elongated time frame uh, as far as that's concerned. So with that. <laughs> but also, I'll mention one thing that's good about that, because since John says it's a poor man's, it allows you the ability to selectively choose what you want instead of pulling everything at once. So you'll be able to identify which specific, which which application, which VM, which file are you trying to bring up instead of bringing everything down? I mean, that's could pretty I, important. Could I ask one question about immutability of Glacier archives that you create? Does the platform respect uh, vault lock policies? Yes. Yes. So um, I could create a vault lock policy that says 24 hours, after 24 hours, only this tag, say SecOps, can um, mess with the archive. And you'll respect it. You'll still continue to back up to it if you're permitted, correct? Yep. Yep. That is cool. Yeah. 